In this segment, what we want to go through is tool holder selection and uh, loading of tools into those tool holders. We've talked a little bit about uh, the um, pros and cons of, of the tool holders that we've got and when the appropriate time is to use uh, those different types. So to begin with, we have three main types of tool holders uh, for holding on to essentially round shank tools down here in the shop. Uh, and they are um, an end mill holder, shown there, um, <coughs> ER collet holder right there, and then this is a double angle collet holder right there. So three different styles of which we'll talk about individually um, here in a second. And uh, be aware that there are various size ranges within each of those three different styles. So there's our three different tool holding styles. Um, all of our CNC machines down here utilize a CAT 40 taper. The CAT 40 taper describes essentially the geometry that's from the, the, the double flange, uh, V flange right here um, on up the back of the holder. So this geometry of this taper right here is just known as a CAT, C-A-T-40. And that's uh, what our spindles are machined to, um, to fit onto. When you purchase a tool holder new, it will come like this, threaded hole in the end, and you have to install a pole stud into the end here. And that's what's just is shown right here. This would be a new pole stud. Those get installed into the end, and then uh, typically your holder is just going to stay um, connected like this. And you have different styles of pole studs, um, ones that have a hole in them, and then those that are blank. If it has a hole, that means that that pole stud is capable of delivering coolant through the holder and then out through a specialized tool that would have essentially holes in it for what's known as a through coolant system. Um, we unfortunately don't have that available on our machine, so although we do have some pole studs that have the hole in them, uh, we don't have the ability to, to use the through coolant system. But regardless, uh, either pole stud will work, and um, when you come down to load machine or load tools into the machine, all of the, the tool holders should already have the pole studs installed. Be aware, though, if you do come across one that that has been removed, you will not be able to load this into the machine. It needs the pole stud in order for the fingers that are up inside the, the spindle to, to grab onto that and, and pull it up and retain it into the spindle. Um, so continuing on, let's then take a look at the end mill holders and talk about how um, those should be loaded and um, their use. So basic end mill holder, I'll put it in a, in a holder over here, has got a precision bore um, that has been ground in it and then there's a set screw on the side and these are designed to hold um, weld on shank tool. So high speed steel tools that have a weld on shank. Here is an example of a high speed steel tool with a weld on shank. The weld on shank essentially means that there is a groove or a flat spot that has been ground into the shank of the tool. And that of course is the area that the set screw will, will seat upon. So when loading a tool into your end mill holder, essentially what you want to do is just uh, slide the shank down inside of there, align the um, flat spot with the set screw, and then tighten it down. However, I need to mention that this can, for, for inexperienced people, that can be tricky because it is possible for you to get that slightly twisted. And you can imagine if I slide this tool in um, like this and bring it down and then tighten the set screw down, well, I won't be tightening it down on the flat spot. I'll be tightening it down on the shank of the tool. And then as you start machining, there is no, essentially no holding power because we're just tightening down on the shank of the tool. So in order to ensure that you've gotten the set screw in the cor uh, correct location, um, one method you can use is essentially just a, um, 
a loosen and check method, and I'll demonstrate that here. So I'll loosen up the set screw, so I can now I can slide the the tool in and out. Um, you notice it's a, it's a very uh, tight fit, uh, just a very a nice slip fit right there. Uh, again, I'm going to line up the the flat spot so it's aligned with the set screw, and slide it in until it's about where I think it should be as far as insertion depth. And then come over, grab your Allen's key, tighten down the set screw, and then just back it off a little bit. So I just tighten it down, hand tighten, back it off just a little bit. If I grab the tool, if I can pull the tool out, that means I missed the flat spot and um, the set screw did not get down inside of that little, uh, that little groove. If I had backed that off just a hair and then um, tried to pull it out, the set screw would be locked down inside of that groove and although I could move this back and forth, I wouldn't be able to pull it out. So let's see if I can do that this time. There, tighten it, tighten it down, just snug it, back it off just a little bit and then try to pull. And sure enough, you can see the tool is moving in and out slightly, but I can't pull it out directly and now I know that I am uh, got the set screw located in the flat spot. So you can bring it over to the holder here and then you install your hex key and snug up that tool in the holder. And there you go, that, that is essentially, that tool has then been loaded into the end mill holder. <clears throat> That's the process. End mill holders are uh, made to hold a variety of different sizes of tools uh, because you know we can have a variety of different size of shanks on our end mills. Here is a one inch end mill that has a three quarter inch shank. This is also a weld on shank, just it's larger, but it has the same flat spot right here. And that, that tool would go into a appropriately sized end mill holder. So again, um, larger set screw, but uh, precision bore um, to receive that three quarter inch shake and same process would go. So we have, um, and you can see this one is a very tight fit. It, it actually holds air and it works almost like an air cylinder. So it's popping back out when I release it. Um, so we have end mill holders that go up quite large, actually up to a one inch, hold up to a one inch shank with this one, and then quite small as well, uh, down to an eighth inch shank here. Um, so a, a pretty wide range of holders to hold different size shanks of tools. Now, some limitations or considerations when using end mill holders. Uh, let's talk about first about accuracy. So essentially, you can imagine that uh, when I tighten this set screw down, what that's doing is forcing the tool up against one side of the bore in the end mill holder. So there is at this you know at this point the fact that I can slide this tool in and out means that there's actual uh, you know physical gap. There's empty space between the shank of the tool and the uh, diameter of the bore. It is small, it's on the order of, of tenths of a thousandth of an inch, so very, very small. Um, but it is in fact there, and so when I tighten this down, essentially what I'm doing is, is bringing the back side, you can kind of think of there's a single line uh, on the back side of the shank that comes in contact with the surface of the inside of the bore there. And so you kind of have, you kind of have the bore right here and you're, you're pushing the edge of the end mill all the way over to that side. And that's going to just build in naturally uh, some run out in your tool. So, so when I, you know, you spin this thing around, your tool isn't going to be spinning around the perfect center of your spindle. It'll actually be offset ever so slightly. And um, depending on the tolerances of your part that you're making, um, that may be significant or may not be. But it is a consideration that you need to understand that it does exist. And um, you may want to account for that. That being said, uh, one of the typical applications that we, we use end mill holders for are those, those less precise type of, type of operations. So when you're doing um, roughing type work, so you're just kind of doing your initial, your initial passes, your initial cuts, you're trying to remove a bunch of material quickly, um, end mill holders will work well for that because the precision is not... Um, necessary at that point. 
Additionally, because it is a set screw uh, holding system, um, there are some considerations or I should say RPM limitations that you should be aware of. As you spin around uh, faster and faster, the centrifugal forces on the set screw are gonna tend to try to wanna loosen it. And because of that, um, end mill holders are, are not necessarily uh, reliable at high RPMs. And I typically uh, suggest that students operate end mill holders at uh, 5,000 RPM or less. Um, some of the smaller ones, for instance, this guy right here, which is for an eighth inch tool, has a very small set screw right there. Um, you know, to, to actually achieve reasonable speeds and feeds, you're gonna have to, with an eighth inch diameter tool, um, you're gonna have to spin it at faster RPMs. But um, deviation is, is uh, somewhat allowed, I guess, at that point, or makes more sense because typically your cutting forces are gonna be much lower, obviously, on a tool that's an eighth inch in diameter versus a tool that's one inch in diameter or half inch in diameter. So you're not, you're not a, you're not loading or exposing the tool to higher cutting forces. So you can run those, uh, you can run those a little bit faster. But in general, I would recommend that you choose um, end mill holders for work that's gonna be more on the roughing side, um, the larger tools, 5,000 RPM and lower. Um, one side note uh, that I want to mention, not necessarily a side note, but an important distinction that needs to be made, um, and that's really identification, based off of identification of your tooling. So I mentioned several times already, the, the, the um, end mill holders are designed for the weld on shank high speed steel tool. It's critical that you are able to identify a high speed steel tool versus a non-high speed steel tool or a solid carbide tool such as I have right here. Um, one of the key differences that you'll notice between high speed steel and the carbide is the fact that the carbide tool does not have a flat spot ground into it. Right there. So this type of uh, cutting tool cannot be installed into an end mill holder. There is no location for the set screw to, to seat against to adequately hold this for the machining forces that will be applied to it when you're cutting. So you cannot use carbide tools in an end mill holder, only the high speed steel with a weld on shank. Make sure that you are able to identify those. Okay, so that allows us to step into the next holder that we have, and uh, <clears throat> that is the ER collet system. So here I have an ER collet holder. Um, of course, again, it consists of uh, the Cat 40 taper with pull set on the end, um, double V flange, and then we have essentially a tapered bore uh, machined into the holder, and then a threaded portion, and then the ER collet nut. And then along with that are the actual ER collets that are used for uh, holding on to your tools. And ER collets come, uh, again, there's a range of sizes for the, the collet holders um, and a range of sizes that uh, match the uh, uh, corresponding collets themselves. But let me pull off some, some collets here. These are all what are known as ER collets. ER essentially stands for extended range, um, meaning that these collets collapse around the shank of the tooling that's installed inside of them as they are installed into the receiving taper on the holder. So here is a set of ER collets. These are uh, ER40 collets, meaning the diameter of the uh, collet here, the largest diameter, major diameter, is 40 millimeters. Um, <clears throat> There's a range of different collet sizes, so those are all ER40s with different bore sizes throughout. And essentially the way that they function um, is that uh, as they're pulled into the taper, all of these slots that are cut into them allow the collet to essentially compress, to squeeze down around the shank of the tool. Uh, here, 
This is a, a ER call. This is an ER 32, so 32 millimeters um, on the diameter. And then there is a corresponding ER call it holder for the ER 32. So you can see that it is um, appropriately sized, but smaller than the ER 40 system. And likewise, we go, we go clear down to um, uh, these are ER-16s, and this would be an ER-16 holder. So smaller, smaller still. So essentially, the, the holder and the collets that you use will reduce in size as the tooling that you're using gets smaller and smaller. But the way that they are installed is uh, effectively the same, and the process that you're going to use is um, the same regardless of which size holder that you're using. So let's, um, let's walk through that here real quick. We can slide these back out of the way, and let me talk about, uh, let's see if I can find it. appropriate size here. There we go. Uh, how you go the, the process of, of loading a tool. So the ER, ER system doesn't, re, doesn't use a, 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 a set screw or anything like that. So they are perfectly um, well suited for holding on to carbide, solid carbide um, shanks. So no, no flat spot. Um, likewise, they can also hold on to a high-speed high speed steel shank as well. So you can use a weld-on shank inside of an ER collet, and it will work perfectly fine as well. So the ER collet system is actually the most versatile, versatile tool holding system that we have. Any round shank tool you can um, load and hold on to with an ER collet. So uh, an end mill, a drill bit, a reamer, a countersink, um, any of those, any of those options, essentially the ER collet system can hold on to. <clears throat> now, installing um, the ER collet into the holder has got just one little nuance, and that's just totally based on the um, the function of the collet itself. Um, the design of the collet. As you can see, it has a, a short taper up on top, a long taper uh, here on the on the the tail end, and then there's a groove cut around um, up near the top. And again, as this collet is seated into the receiving taper, and that's done by by you know tightening down on the nut. What, what that will do is squeeze the collet in around the the shank of the tool, and that holds it. Um, but these have been designed with the, the taper geometry right here is, is a self-locking machine taper, which basically means as I tighten this um, taper down or force it down into the receiving taper on this end, it will friction lock in place. Uh, <clears throat> And I would not be able to pull that thing out. So if you know, I, if I grabbed a hammer and you know stuck my tool in there, grabbed a hammer and beat it down in there, I could not just pull that thing back out. I'd have to have some way to to grab onto that collet to to pull it out. And that is the reason that this groove um, exists on on the collet right here, so that uh, you can get something down inside of there to pull that collet out of the the hole when you're taking it apart. <clears throat> um, that's accomplished with an eccentric ring um, that's mounted on the inside of the nut. So this is the large, the large um, collet nut here, so that you can easily see, but you'll notice that there is um, an eccentric ring, so basically a large part and a smaller part. And this is just, a, this is basically a washer that's pressed uh, inside of the, the nut. And the function of that is that this large part right here is intended to set down inside of the groove on the collet itself, so that when I when I pull this thing out or unscrew the nut, pull it pull the nut out, you know you've got basically this groove that that washer is sitting down inside, and when I when I go to back it out, it's going to unscrew and come up and hit up on the on the upper end of the groove here that uh, washer will, and then as you continue to unscrew it, it'll basically pull the collet up 
out of the taper and break that friction lock so you can get the whole system apart. Um, the nuts and bolts of that is, is when I put this together, I have to make sure that I am engaging this uh, nut, or excuse me, engaging the eccentric washer in the groove. And there's a little trick to do it. You can't just take the collet and push it in there and expect it to seat up right. Now, if I flip this thing over, you know, just putting those two things together and flip it over, you'll notice that there is a, a gap. I can see space between the um, the collet face and the, the face of the um, the nut there. Um, and that's because this washer is essentially hitting up here on this bevel, on this tapered part. And um, you don't want to do that. You want to be able to get the washer to fit down the side of there. A simple way to do that, you just basically rock the collet towards the, um, the side of the nut that has the taper, and then you just roll it through. And then when I flip that thing over, you'll notice that on this nut, it essentially sits flush and flat, but there is no gap, there is no space um, as I look around uh, the interface right there. The, I can tell that the, the bevel on the, on the collet is seated up against the, the mating bevel on the inside of the nut. So you put the collet into the nut first, uh, just like this, and then you'll take these two over to your holder, and then set those down inside of the holder, and then screw the nut down onto the holder a little ways, just so that it starts to tighten up a little bit. Then you want to grab your tool and slide it into the, uh, I went a little too far, slide it into the call itself, and then you can snug it down. And if you're interested in, in achieving a certain amount of stick out, um, you can measure that. Um, and depending on how critical it is, if you're if you're setting your tool links off, you can have a precision setup to do that. Or if you're just trying to reach roughly a certain amount that uh, you've kind of designed your program to run on. So let's say I need I need to have two inches of stick out, um, roughly two inches of stick out on on my tool here, because I know I programmed my my program to to need um, that much to stick out to to reach down over some fixtures or something. Um, set my tool length and then you can hand tighten that down uh, and then in order to lock it in or torque it in you need to grab the appropriate spanner wrench so there are a couple different sizes that we do have this is the large size so this would fit this guy it's going to engage um, simply by dropping into those grooves just like that and then you just come over here grab it of course and you want to put a pretty good amount of torque we don't have a torque wrench for this but you do want to snug that up tightly um, so you can sure that it'll hold all the machining forces for you um, there is appropriate size spanner wrench for the different size call it so again for the er40 it's going to be this guy if i was using uh, the er32 system then i'd have a smaller um, spanner wrench and you see there you go looks the same but drops right in and engages into that one like so and then um, for the smallest guys the ER 16 these these little boys um, that one just requires a one inch uh, open end wrench so you just tighten it up and loosen up with a regular regular wrench for the littlest guys um, and all of these tools are going to be available uh, at the, the tool loading station that's basically in the center of the, the CNC area in the red toolboxes. Okay. Now, disassembly is just the exact opposite. Drop that back in there, done machining, clean it all off, bring my spanner wrench, and then what will happen is you'll break it loose. Now here we go, I've loosened the nut, you keep turning that and you'll get to the point where basically it will tighten up again. So right there it's tightened up and that's that's where the... the um, the collet has basically friction locked, and in order to break that loose, I'll have to grab the spanner wrench again, and then put that on there, and then I can snap that loose, and then uh, pull out my tool, take the system apart. And then break it down. OK, 
Okay, now um, I mentioned earlier that the ER collet system is our most versatile. Um, one, because it can hold on to any style of tool shank, regardless of whether it's carbide um, or high speed steel with a weld on shank in the flat spot. But um, it also is a very accurate uh, tool holding system because it's uniformly compressed essentially as this, this is pushed down into the receiving taper. So there's very little run out in the system as opposed to that, that set screw system that pushes, pushes the uh, end mill uh, over to one edge on the end mill holders. Uh, so the ER call it is going to be um, one of our most accurate systems as far as run out alignment of our tool. So it's very good for um, finishing passes, tools that you're going to run for finishing passes. Also, it's a very strong system, so it can hold high cutting loads and high cutting forces. Uh, so it'll work fine for roughing, roughing tools. Um, and there is essentially well, most of the ER collets that we buy um, are balanced to 10,000 RPM. So essentially when, I, when you buy a ER collet holder and the, and the collets themselves, these systems are sold in, in, and the manufacturer will list the, the RPM that they've been balanced to, meaning that they've, they've spun those things up and um, machined them so that they're force balanced to various RPMs. Most ones that you, you can get today are balanced to, to 12,000 RPM and then some up even higher. Um, our systems are at least tw or at least 10,000 RPM or uh, or higher balance. Our, our we only have two machines that go to 10,000 RPM, so um, all of our ER collets will work in uh, any of our machines, and you essentially don't need to worry about the RPM that you'll be using them at because they will work for for any of them. Now. Um, just a quick a quick note here on the collets themselves and uh, quality. Um, it's important that when you're putting this system together that you do have kind of a critical eye um, for the collets. The whole system essentially relies on having good mechanical contact, good friction contact between the tapered, the large tapered surface of the collet and the holder. And then of course, um, the precision bore uh, on the inside of the collet and the shake of your tool. And if any of those are damaged, then it will it reduces the um, the holding power on that you will, can generate, and it um, can also reduce accuracy. So, if you if we just take a, a quick look at um, at these two, maybe I'll even pull in here a, a brand new one because it's maybe a little brighter. You can kind of see it better. But what I wanted to point out. Uh, this center collet, which is one that's been in use for a while, and I've actually pulled it out of service um, because you can see here on the edge, there's a bunch of uh, edges that have basically been damaged. And that's likely from, from improper loading of tools into the collet, uh, potentially from crashes, crashes into, uh, into um, fixturing and stuff from tools holding on this or the tool gets jerked um, in it. Um, usually that coupled with the, the nut not properly being tightened, so there's a little bit of play in the system, and it, then it, uh, uh, when it gets either crashes or gets really high machining loads, it can um, round out or wallow out the, the bore on the collet. So you can see this one is basically damaged up here on the edge, and um, that's not a good collet anymore. What you really want is, is, of course, like this one where the edges are crisp. There's a you know a little bit of a broken edge there to keep the burr away, but basically they're 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 sharp and, and crisp, um, like on those two right there, and um, there's no no burrs or bumps like that. So when you are putting your collets together, you want to um, just take a second and inspect the bore of the collet and make sure that um, it's in good shape. And you also want to inspect the taper uh, on the outside of the collet that there's no 
um, nicks or um, gouges, of course, chips um, down that might be caught down inside of the grooves. All that was going to interfere with the compression of the thing. So essentially, you know, you just need to take good care of these these collets. They need to be clean um, and well cared for, so they don't have a bunch of of nicks and and, and um, gouges and stuff on them. You don't don't want to drop these. You don't want to kick them. All that kind of stuff is going to cause damage. That when you start putting the system together. Um, can interfere with the the mating of the um, the call it into the receiving taper um, and the lockdown. Of course, same same discussion applies to uh, to this guy as well. So when you're done using these guys, you should you should wipe them down. I typically recommend that you you grab a you grab a rag. Um, we usually will blow out the coolant. Coolant will get inside of there. You want to blow that out, wipe it out. Even though the coolant has got um, corrosion resistant stuff, it's still a water soluble coolant. So if it's left in there, it will corrode over time. But wipe it out with WD-40. Typically, I'll even just spray the the um, the adapter with WD-40 and just wipe all that stuff out. <laughs> Keep the threads clean and clear. This will build up with chips, and if you don't clear those out and you start screwing the nut back on top of the the threaded portion and there's chips in there, then you'll just mar up um, both one or both of the parts and then ruin the system. Um, <clears throat> You know, a holder and a collet itself, those together are going to be over $200 um, plus the pole stud. So you're almost, you're approaching $300 just for this without even a tool. Uh, so you can, you can damage them beyond uh, repair really, relatively quickly just by negligent use. So it's important that you're making sure you're doing a good job putting those things together. Okay, the... Uh, The final system then that we have for holding on tools down here in the shop is uh, what's known as a double angle collet system. And here are two uh, double angle collet holders. These are the only two sizes that we currently have. So essentially, it's similar to the ER collet system. You've got the, the holder itself with a bore and a very small taper, and you have a nut. Um, we have a large and a small side. I think this is a DA200, and I think this is a 300, but uh, I don't remember exactly. Um, these are the examples of the collets that goes with the double angle system. Um, again, both are double angle systems. They're just two different sizes, so scaled up and down. Um, and the, the geometry is different from the, the ER collet. You can see, um, of course, the ER collet has got the long taper in the back. The double, double, double angle system just has uh, a short taper and essentially two different diameters. And that's significant um, for the application um, uh, that they're intended for. So the ER collet, which I mentioned is a universal holder, can hold anything, but primarily, you know, it's designed to, to hold high cutting forces because of that long taper. Um, so it can, you know, it can handle uh, machine, heavy machining loads. The double angle system does not have that same taper. It's just got a little taper right here, and that, you know, lines up with the taper on the on the inside right there. <coughs> um, but that doesn't put the same amount of compression force or squeeze onto the shank of the tool. What that essentially means is that double angle collets are not intended really for handling. Um, milling loads, machining loads from, from milling tools. Uh, we use them primarily for hole making tools. So they're excellent for drill bits. Um, probably your best choice for a drill, they are your best choice for a drill bit. Um, also countersinks, reamers, um, essentially, you know, that, that type of stuff. Hole making and hole, hole uh, counter bores, um, um, those, those type of tools. Uh, but you do not you do not want to use these to hold on to, to end mills. 
So uh, to load one up is really simple. There is no friction lock uh, associated with, with this collet. So I, when I tighten it down, when I take the loosen the nut up, it's just going to come right apart. So I don't have to engage any kind of eccentric washer in them. So you just put the holder right down into uh, uh, the table holder. You drop your collet in. Typically we'll install the, the nut and run it down again just so it just barely starts to tighten up. I have a drill bit um, for this application. I'll drop that in there and then snug it up by hand. And then to tighten it up, you just grab the appropriate sized um, open end wrench, and we got our big old guy right here. It's kind of fun to use. And you just snug him up. Again, you want to use um, good, good torque. You tighten that down so that uh, um, it's held securely in there. And then that guy is ready to go. And then to take it apart is just the opposite. Drop it in there just like so. Your open end wrench. Loosen it up and see the tool drops away immediately. You unscrew that system. Pull it out. Tool comes out. And away you go. Essentially the care discussion that we had with the with the ER collets, um, that applies here as well. Uh, you want to make sure that the, the, the grooves are clean, there's no chips in there. Um, and likewise, you want to inspect your, your double angle collets for the bore, um, make sure that's in good shape and that there's, uh, there's nothing going on um, on the outside here as well. And that will ensure that you get a little better life out of your double angle collet system. Uh, so, so there, there you go. We got again our 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 double angle collet system, our end mill collet system, and our ER collet um, holders right there. Those are going to be the three primary ones that you will be using in the shop. Um, we do have also um, drill drill chucks available. So here you go. We got a, a drill chuck. Um, and uh, th there's times that this is this is useful. Um, these are not the most accurate um, option. A, a double angle collet system is certainly going to be a more accurate and better choice. But there are times where we simply just don't have the right size um, collet. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about appropriate sizing here in, in a second. But just sometimes you just don't have the right size collet to match the shank of your tool. And especially with drill bits, when there's a wide range of drill bit sizes, the drill chuck is going to be, um, it may be your only option to be able to hold on to the tools because, you, you know, essentially you got infinite adjustment on uh, diameters that you can put inside of there up to the, the size limit of the chuck itself. But again, it's, it's basically um, just mounted in the end mill holder. We just got a, a drill chuck that's got a straight shank um, that's in size of a half inch diameter bore end mill holder. So this is going to have more run out um, than, a, than a double angle collet for sure, um, but it's a, a good choice. Now, when you're loading a, a tool or a drill bit, I should say, in a drill chuck for use on the CNC, you do want to ensure that you get a good tight um, Clamping on the on the chuck because the the cutting forces can can be pretty high. You don't you don't have control of that with your hand like you do out on a drill press or on a milling a manual milling machine. You know where you're typically are, are controlling that the the load rate. So this is already going to be programmed. So you want to make sure that it's held in there tight. So make sure you always are, are loading. Um, the the holder in the or the drill chuck in the holder here and you just simply you know just like you would suspect put that in there couple couple good hands on that and you can really tighten it down snug to ensure that you're biting that in there and then that would you could be sure that that would be able to, to hold the um, cutting loads that you'd be exposing that to and then take it apart of course just the reverse of that so drill chucks are available and, and you can use those as need to. Recommend you typically stay 5,000 RPM and under with a drill chuck of those. It'll, it'll potentially spin loose on you when you're using it. And you certainly don't want that.
So I want to take just a, a couple minutes here and talk about uh, this, uh, essentially, again, reiterate how, how these, these two call-out systems are working and some problems that, that arise with improper loading, just so everyone understands the impact of ensuring that they're, they're picking essentially the right call-out size for the particular tool that they might be using. So again, here's, you know, there's our two, our two call-outs that we have, the ER call-out system, double angle call-out system. They both both are designed as compression holding devices, so essentially as either one of these are drawn or, or pushed into by their respective nuts into the receiving tapers, the, the bore compresses down, right? It compresses down around the shank of the tool. And you can imagine if, uh, you know, if we're just kind of looking at uh, this drill bit as an example, you know, the size of my hand representing um, the size of the, the bore diameter, as that's pulled into or pushed into the taper, basically, of course, the collet is squeezing in like this as it goes. And then it evenly will compress around the whole length of the, the shank of the tool, which is great. That's where you get all your holding power from. <clears throat> Now, the, the, the thing about that, though, is, is it's absolutely essential that the, the collet can, in fact, um, compress down evenly like that. And that requires that the, uh, the shank size that you have on your tool um, essentially be uh, smaller than the, the diameter of um, the bore in the collet. On size, I should I should rephrase that and say essentially either on size or smaller than the the um, the stamp size on your collet. So each of these collet is going to have essentially the diameter of the bore listed on it. Um, you know, in this collet set, sometimes the smaller ones that they have a harder time getting it on the collet. So you know, you'll have a a, a labeling system. Um, often the smaller ones will have it laser etched on the. Uh, edge of the call it itself, but you need to identify that and so you know what the diameter of the bore is. If you, you know, if that's been worn off, then certainly grab your calipers and measure it so you got some idea. But <clears throat> Essentially, the problem that we often have with students that are new to this, um, they'll find a collet that is uh, not the right size, but try to force a tool in into the wrong size, the wrong size. Um, Bore. And that, that is especially true with the double angle call it system and um, drill bits because there's such a wide range of drill bit diameters and we have a, a, a more limited set of double angle call its. Uh, there isn't always a good match. What you need to recognize is that either one of these types of systems is essentially designed to hold on to um, the, the shank tool size that matches the diameter of the bore or smaller than that value, typically down to around 15 thousandths of an inch. That's one of the reasons that the ER call it got its name, the extended range. It basically means it can compress down an extended range um, from earlier designs, I guess, I'm not sure, but but uh, general rule of thumb for most of the call-it sizes that we have, uh, you can squeeze down about 15 thousandths of an inch and expect this still to hold on to the, the shank of your tool um, and not risk damaging the call-it um, or the system that you're using. What happens when you deviate from that, so if you go too small, then, um, so if you go too small on the underside of uh, 15, then this won't be able to squeeze down far enough to adequately grip the tool. And then you can have what, essentially what can happen is this guy can spin inside the bore of the collet when you're machining. And that will just essentially wear this guy out and wear out the shank of your tool. The stream case, of course, it, it actually would you pull the, the tool out of the call it system. And then, um, you know, you're certainly risking um, damaging the tool. Likely you're going to break the tool. Um, but you may, you, may, you may mess up your part that you spent 15 or 20 hours working on as well. And uh, a lot of times that can be the, the, worst, the worst scenarios that you've got a lot of work that you're throwing away now. So you, on, the, on the underside, you can be too small, and then you won't be able to adequately hold. 
Um, but more commonly, especially with the double ink hole, it's on the larger side, um, you can be too large. And if you're too large and you try to force that tool in there, you can cause some pretty serious damage and deformation to the, um, the collet system. So um, here's an example. I have this drill bit here that I selected. And um, this, is, this is just under three, three eighths of an inch. So a three eighths collet, this slides in. And you know, you notice as I slide this in, it slides in freely. There's a little bit of space. The the um, the gap on the slot there doesn't open up at all. But uh, when I install this in a holder, that would squeeze down. I can even do it with my fingers, and it'll it'll start holding onto the shank of the tool right away. So I know that this this. Uh, well, I know just from the diameter, but I know that, that this collet and this tool would work together well. Alternatively, uh, here's the next size down collet, which is a 2364. If I slide these two together, so immediately I cannot just slide that in directly, but as I force this in there, if you watch that gap right there, you'll see that it actually opens up and expands a little bit. And that is an indication that the shank is too large for the, the diameter of the, of the bore that's in there. You'll also notice that, uh, maybe you'll notice that as I I'll do that again right there, so you can see that in the camera, that it's not opening up evenly. Um, right around here on the uh, edge of the shaft, you can actually see a little gap. Um, and, and that's where essentially what's happened is, you know, normally, like I described, the, the, uh, the call is designed to, to go down like this. When I put a larger tool in there, the larger tool doesn't evenly spread the call it out like this. It basically pops it like that. And then when I take a, a, a collet that's been deformed in, in this case and I drop it into, um, you know, its mating holder, and then squeeze it down in there, and then I squeeze it back like this. And so I've really just deformed the, um, the collet really badly, and that can cause um, some pretty serious damage to the collet. One, it's not gonna hold well, because instead of you know, being flat, it's gonna be all kinds of weird, weird shapes. Um, but you get damage that, that can, be, uh, can be shown similar to, to a couple of these. These two right here are, are really prime examples. You can see that they are, they're just not even round anymore. Um, some of the gaps are totally closed up. These have been crushed in. And that's from the case of them being, you know, ex expanded out and then compressed down so hard just to get it to hold onto the tool that the, the collet itself has been totally deformed. So these are these are really no good anymore. They've been destroyed from improper improper loading. And you, you really need to make sure that you're doing a good job, both with your double angle system and your ER collet system, that you're selecting the right diameter bore for your collet to match the diameter sh shank of your tool. So that's one type of damage that that um, that you can you can cause, and I should mention you should inspect for. So as you're going through your um, your selection of collets, if you find one of these guys, you don't want to use it. You want to set that aside, bring it to the shop manager, get it out of circulation, because that's not a that's not a good um, collet to use anymore. Get that out. Um, but other things that you want to look for as well um, can be seen with, with these guys right here. So I have, uh, again, ER-16, so the small ER um, size collets, and then some, some double angle collets right here. And these ones um, are not examples of improper loading. They're just more examples, well, this one might be improper loading. Um, but most likely this damage is caused from, from crashes while machining. So these two collets, you can see um, essentially some marks on the face of it. So a bunch of impact marks essentially right here along the face of that. And you can see impact mark here, uh, impact right there. And that's just probably the case where the tool um, went too far down and ran into a fixture on the face of the collet or actually ran down into the part because um, depths were, were not set up right or, or um, stick out wasn't right. But you can see the thing, the thing you want to look for is that the, the gap here is no longer uniform. There's a, there's a definite smearing of the material across those two edges where those two still look like they're in relatively decent shape. And then that's, that's a similar case with this guy. Um, 
a lot of smearing, smearing of material. There's a lot of burrs that have been raised up in there. And so these two guys, essentially, they, they may not actually work well anymore because when you try to squeeze them down, you're going to get you're going to get material up there that uh, uh, will prevent that from happening. So those would not be good choices to use anymore. Um, for the ER system, uh, here, here's another example. This one's probably um, was impacted. Uh, there's a, a chip right here. This is kind of one thing I wanted to show with this one. Um, right here on that edge, um, that's been rounded off or chipped off, um, probably because this was smashed into, into some material and there looks like some smearing. The hole doesn't really look round anymore. It looks almost hexagonal. Uh, so uh, something definitely impacted right there uh, and took, took those edges out, and so that would not be a good choice. Now this one, um, this is a case where this guy, the, the tool um, may have been loose. It may have just wrapped it into something, so you can see that it's basically this side is crisp. There's relatively good edges but this side here you can see has definitely had an impact and then that's been deformed and, and essentially crushed in and there's almost what looks like a big chamfer on that edge right there so i would surmise that there was a, a drill bit in there that uh you know either ran in something into in a rapid travel and that just you know tweaked it really hard um or potentially they tried to, to put an end mill in this guy and do some heavy machining with it and um, just the cutting forces itself just pulled the tool over and, um, and bent that out. That can also happen if you don't have this guy securely tightened and the tool isn't held rigidly in there. If there's a little bit of, of play, degree of freedom, then, then that will... Um, allow it to, to, to deform and, and bend over right there. So you need to ensure that you're tightening all your stuff up, and if you do have a crash, um, you know, you need to inspect your collets um, afterwards. But but especially on installation, you find a collet that's got a, a situation that you're not going to want to use it because it's not going to be trustworthy to hold your, your tooling in rigidly as well. Okay. Oh, damn it. This guy. Okay. Now, after you've inspected your collets, um, you also want to take a look at your adapters as well. Um, and, and this is a great example. You know, I, I highly suspect that one of these collets that has the impact marks on the collet itself was probably in this holder right here. But uh, what I want to point out is essentially you look at the, the, the upper lip of this holder right here and you can see that there is a crack that runs all the way through that. So this thing... Um, Potentially took an impact, but I will say out say out say this though that these holders have a they have a limited life to them. You know, every time you tighten up a tool and load it in there and it goes through a machining cycle, is, this is getting loaded and unloaded. So there's a, a fatigue life that's going to be associated with each one of these um, holders. And um, one of the things when they when they wear out is you can see a crack right there. And so that crack um, is going to weaken it. You would not want to use this um, for risk of other cracks could show up, could fly apart on you while it's, while it's in the machine and, and machining. So make sure that not only are you inspecting inspecting your collets for damage, but you're also inspecting your holders for damage as well uh, before, you, before you tighten everything up and load it in the machine for machining.